The sun was setting over Tampa Bay and the Manatee River on a breezy Sunday in January 2013. Local resident Jill Mullins was on edge. As the light outside dimmed, Jill's husband, Patrick, who had left in his small boat that afternoon, had still not returned home. As the hours passed, concern turned into panic as family members set out on the river in the dark to search for Pat and his boat. They would not find him that night. Over the following days, discoveries made in the water would form a mystery that would persist for years. And questions seemed only to compound. How had Pat's boat traveled so far undetected? Could Pat have seen something on the water that day that led to his disappearance? Had Pat been murdered? Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and this is Just Thought Lounge. Today's case is a perplexing and troubling mystery. New information has shed light on this now 10-year-old case. New developments have brought with it renewed interest and hope that all of the pieces can be put together. So let's take a look. Patrick Mullins met his future wife, Jill, while they were both studying at the University of Florida. He was from Manatee County, and she was from Sarasota. But they did not cross paths until Jill became roommates with his brother's girlfriend. The two were a great match from the start. They married in 1983 and purchased a house in Bradenton, Florida. Their new home was next to the river, a tributary to the Braden which feeds through to the Manatee River to the north. They had two sons, Mason and Miles. Pat was a dedicated and beloved fourth grade teacher for years. He returned to his studies alongside Jill and both earned a master's degrees to become media specialists and qualified librarians. Pat sang in the church and barbershop quartet. He served in the National Guard. By early 2013, their boys had grown into men and left the house, one studying in university and the other serving overseas in Afghanistan. Pat loved his work as the school librarian at Palmetto High School, but was also looking forward to his retirement. He and brother Gray had plans to launch their own business. By all accounts, Pat was poised to launch into a new and exciting chapter in his life. The 27th of January 2013 was a Sunday. Before Jill left the house to run some errands, Pat said he planned to take his small boat, a roughly 14 foot long flat bottomed stump knocker, out onto the river for a spin. The boat had not seen much use lately and needed to have a test run to ensure the engine was in working order. Pat often took his boat out on the Braden River, which connected through to the much larger Manatee River to the north. The waters became much deeper in the Manatee, and then out into Tampa Bay. Pat's small boat was intended for the shallow waters, which was where Jill believed he was heading that afternoon. Neighbors saw Pat leaving the house around 3 p.m. He stopped by a hardware store for a few items that were dropped at home. Then, he unhooked the boat and set out into the water. Jill returned that evening around 6 p.m. to find that her husband had not yet returned. His vehicle was in the drive, but the boat was gone. Immediately, alarm bells started ringing for Jill. It was a Sunday night. Pat would not be out past dinner time and into the evening on a work night. As the hours passed and there was still no word from Pat, Miles came in from Tampa and joined his uncle on the river, searching for his father. Had the librarian been injured in the boat and unable to steer it home? Had there been an accident and Pat had become stranded? By 11 p.m., Jill had contacted the Manatee County Sheriff's Office. The Coast Guard, the USCG, were looped in and search teams were set out, in the air and on the water. Two days after Pat went missing, his unmanned boat, Greentop 
pulled down, was spotted drifting northwest of Egmont Key, far to the west of the smaller river where Pat had, presumably, entered the water. Using what the USCG called reverse drift methods, in conjunction with checks on tide and wind, they determined that the boat drifted from somewhere in lower Tampa Bay. Jill Mullins had told the USCG that Pat had transited to Terracia Bay in the past, but it is very unlikely that he would have planned to go there when he was scheduled to go to work the next morning. She and a friend of Pat's who were interviewed by the USCG also reported that Pat would never go into Tampa Bay with his small boat. Yet somehow, that is exactly where it was eventually found. When they searched the small vessel, they found many of Pat's belongings still inside. These included a life jacket, flotation devices, two gas fuel tanks, two bottles of water, one completely empty and the other full, a pair of sunglasses, and a straw hat. The engine was in neutral and appeared to have run through the attached tank of gas. The USCG and the sheriff's office found no signs of foul play. There was no sign of injury. There were no indications that a struggle had taken place. Luminol testing of the interior and exterior of the small vessel did not return the presence of blood. The boat was brought back into shore and held outside for a period. Then eventually, it was returned to the Mullins family. Once stored safely at home, they noticed markings on the boat that had not been there before. Lines of red paint, rubbed off from another source, were visible along the side of the vessel. Photographs of the paint were taken, as well as a sample, to be held for potential testing. With no other leads emerging at this stage, the search for Pat continued. The Mullins family hoped that this one small piece of evidence, these few scraps of paint, may hold the key to what had happened to Pat. On February 5th, nine days after Pat went missing, fisherman Jeffrey Page spotted a body floating face down in the water. The location was at almost a straight line from where Pat's boat had been found, near Egmont Channel Marker, northwest of Sneeds Island. When the deceased man was pulled from the water, he was positively identified. It was Patrick Mullins. Pat had been tied up with a rope, which was connected to an anchor dropped into the water. He was floating in a relatively shallow area of only about four to six feet in depth. He was missing one shoe. You can go from the channel, which is extremely deep, off the channel, where it could be two to three foot of water. And that's where this body was. The autopsy was performed by Dr. Russell Vega, the chief medical examiner for Florida's 12th district. The cause of death was determined to be a shotgun blast to the head. Although a single fatal shot appeared most likely, Experts could not rule out that Pat had, possibly, been shot more than once. The autopsy report stated that Pat was found in a state that was consistent with having been in the water for a period of eight to nine days, the exact time that he had been missing. But there was one glaring oddity. The fisherman, Jeffrey, remarked that he found the man to be very clean. Aside from the obvious damage from a gunshot, Pat Mullins was in shockingly good condition given that he was believed to have been underwater for over a week before he was discovered. Specifically, the idea that Pat's body would go untouched by the local fauna for that amount of time seems particularly improbable, given that the waters of Tampa Bay are known to be home to a significant population of sharks. It was surmised that the head wound would almost certainly have drawn scavengers. In addition, many boats were out on the Manatee River on the weekend that Pat went missing. The weather had been notably pleasant on those days. The Suncoast Gun Show in Palmetto was at the Bradenton Area Convention Center that same weekend, seven miles from where Pat was found. 
It seemed implausible that Pat could have gone unnoticed for so long. Speculation about his time in the water, however, is distinct from the facts informing the medical examination. Dr. Vega could not determine the circumstances of the death through the autopsy. In other words, he could not rule out the wound that caused his death as being self-inflicted. The circumstances of Patrick Mullen's death were deemed undetermined. Jill Mullins, alongside her two sons and the wider community, came out to mourn the loss of a loving husband, father, friend, and educator. The impact that Pat had on his students was apparent during a standing room only memorial service at Palmetto High School two days after his body was found. That suicide could not be ruled out by the medical examiner seemed to confirm the assumptions of the Manatee County Sheriff's Office, the MCSO. Gray Mullins, Pat's brother, recalled that in follow-up interviews with law enforcement, they were primarily seeking to determine if his brother had been unhappy. Pat had spent time with his brother the night before he went missing. Gray described him as in good spirits, not at all depressed or worried, and spoke about how he was looking forward to his retirement. Despite this, Jill Mullins recalled the sheriff's team asking her to accept that her husband had done this to himself. She would not. The MCSO deny making these statements. The investigation found no health scares, no drug or alcohol problems, no financial irregularities in Pat Mullen's life, and no suggestions that he might want to do himself harm. We had a very good relationship. Uh, we would have been married 30 years in June, and, and this happened at the end of January. Um, we raised the two kids and they had grown and were out of the house, so we had kind of rediscovered one another and were uh, really looking forward to retirement. Perhaps the weakest link in the suicide theory is that Pat Mullins never owned a shotgun. A forensic audit of his bank accounts conducted by the MCSO failed to find any evidence that he had ever withdrawn the money required to buy a shotgun. Both the sheriff's investigation and a second independent investigation undertaken by a journalist consulted local gun dealers, and both failed to locate any indications that Pat had ever acquired a weapon. There was no gun found in the water. Regardless of what appeared to be blatant inconsistencies, the theory being proposed by the Manatee County Sheriff's Office posited that Patrick Mullins had tied a 25-pound anchor to his body and threw the anchor overboard himself. In support of this theory, investigators pointed to the rope tied around Pat's waist and legs, positioned in a location that he could have reasonably done it himself. Had his death been a homicide, they believed that his legs or hands would have been tied and not left free. That is, assuming he had been tied up prior to being shot, and not afterwards. The nature of the knots in the rope, however, raised more questions. The rope attached to the anchor and to Pat was wrapped vertically twice over the shoulder and between the legs, and then wrapped around his waist six times. Experts reviewing the knots couldn't help but note the difficulty of layering the ropes in this manner while standing or sitting in the small boat. The nature of the wrapping caused one boating expert to comment that Pat looked like he was made into a package. His family pointed to Pat's years of experience on the water. They believed that had he attached the rope to himself, he would have used a single knot to secure himself to the anchor rather than the amateurish multi-knot arrangement that was used. It was not until April that year that a systematic search of the water was conducted in the area where Pat was found. The USCG's approach was known as mowing the lawn, 
the search teams followed a pattern out in 10 feet intervals while towing snorkel gear behind the boats to view the bottom of the water. Using this method, the USCG eventually covered an over 22,000 square yard grid of the water where Pat's body was recovered. It would have been reasonable, had he died in that location, to have also recovered both his missing shoe and the shotgun through these search efforts. But neither item was found. The popular librarian had no known enemies. By all accounts, he had a very happy marriage. He had future plans of going into business with his brother. Pat appeared optimistic about the future. So what could have occurred on the water that Sunday afternoon that would have led to his death? He was out there and he saw something he shouldn't have seen. Um, must have been pretty serious that the person would be carrying a shotgun on them and would be willing to use it. Pat was widely known to be a very helpful and considerate man. Friends consistently reported to the MCSO that he was the type of person that would not have hesitated to approach another boat to offer assistance if the passengers were perceived to be in any kind of trouble. That the engine was left on to run out of fuel suggested that Pat had intended on making only a brief stop. The USCG did return one potentially significant lead early on. Two friends, out taking pictures on the Sunday that Pat vanished, spotted what they believed to be his boat with the green top up, heading west towards Passage Key. One of the friends recounted seeing three boats in total departing the area by Terracia Bay around the same time, none of which he recognized. Neither friend had seen the person in Pat's boat clearly enough to identify them. However, they did report with confidence that only a single individual had been inside when they saw it pass. In order for Pat's boat to travel in the water from his launching point on the Braden River to the point that it was discovered, it would have necessarily passed at least one point along the route covered by security cameras. As it turns out, there is a camera at the CSX train bridge that likely would have captured the vessel. The MCSO records show that a detective requested that video recording on January 28th, the same day that the boat was found. USCG logs indicate that they were informed by the sheriff's office that investigators were en route to collect and view the video that day. But no one arrived at the bridge and the video was not obtained at that time. This failure, more than any other misstep in the investigation, is the likely reason that the death investigation did not turn into that of a homicide early on. Certainly, a video that potentially showed someone other than Pat on his boat that day would have tipped the scales. But it is unclear what, if anything, the surveillance would have shown. When the Mullins family requested the tape, the file had been corrupted and the footage lost. The MCSO had failed to obtain it and there were no backup files. I don't feel that anyone is actually looking for answers. Extremely traumatic, can't get any worse, right? When something like this happens to a loved one. So yes, we want to bring closure for the family resolution for the family because certainly that's what we want. I mean, we don't want to, we're not working against the family here. We're, we're trying to work with the family. In 2021, Lori Baker, a forensic investigator, was hired by the Mullins family to re-examine the possible scenarios. Dr. Russell Vega's autopsy found that Pat died from a shotgun blast to the head, delivered at close range. But there were no indications of a contact wound. Investigator Baker therefore surmised that the long-barreled shotgun would need to have been held awkwardly, pointed towards but away from the head. The angle was not impossible, just very unlikely, given the bulk of the gun and the distance of the shot. Perhaps more telling was her determination that had this been the scenario that occurred, it would have been impossible 
to find no blood anywhere on the boat. This was particularly true once one factored in the breeze coming off of the water that day. Lori Baker's final report concluded that after reviewing over 400 pages of police reports, medical examiner's reports, conducting her own research, and interviewing seven subject matter experts, there is no clearly defined unanimous opinion as to how Patrick Mullins died. On a scale, she wrote, it appeared to be a homicide. Jill Mullins continued her quest for answers. She worked with local community groups to fundraise for a reward to be paid out to anyone offering information that could lead to an arrest. She also pressured the MCSO repeatedly with questions about the evidence and what she saw as obvious failures in their investigation. While the community rallied behind Jill, there was one other individual who began to draw attention. Professional chef Damon Crestwood was a longtime friend of Pat's brother Gray and a longtime friend of the Mullins family. Damon had apparently not been close with Pat friendly acquaintances at most, according to those who knew them. So, Damon's extreme response to Pat's death raised suspicions. According to Gray, Damon would break into tears and then uncontrollable sobbing after Pat had passed away. Jill reported that Damon admitted to her that he would go and look out along the Manatee River and cry and sob for hours. His grief was described as proportionally overwhelming. Damon had a fixation with Pat's case and what seemed to be an unreasonable emotional attachment. Then, during Memorial Day celebrations later in 2013, Damon offered other attendees a bizarre display. In front of friends and family, Damon tied a rope to himself and then to his dog. But the most chilling aspect was that he did so in a manner strikingly similar to the way in which Pat had been tied when he was found in the water. Witnesses to these actions were shocked. They were disturbed. When they asked him for an explanation, Damon had none. Every January, around the anniversary of Pat's death, Damon suffered from what friends referred to as a mental breakdown. He had developed a problem with drugs, namely meth, and was suffering the consequences. Along with his inexplicable behavior, it also did not go unnoticed that Damon had a boat of his own. A ski nautic. Curiously, Damon's boat had a red painted stripe along the side. At the time of Pat's death, Damon was also a resident in a neighborhood northwest of the Mullins. He would put in his boat on the Manatee River near to the opening of Tampa Bay. This placed Damon Crestwood in close proximity to the area where Pat was eventually found. Damon refused to sit down to an interview with law enforcement. He denied having anything to do with Pat's death, but would not speak any further on the topic. He also denied law enforcement access to his boat. No sample of the red paint could be taken. For a family friend so distraught over Pat's death, his refusal to cooperate, to some, spoke volumes. Meanwhile, the chef's addiction was taking over his life. In 2017, four years after Pat Mullen's death, Damon Crestwood died of an overdose. What secrets he may have held about the murder of Pat Mullins died with him. However, there remained hope for some answers. Damon's daughter kindly offered access to her father's boat after his passing. Testing of the red paint from Damon's ski nautic was performed against the sample taken from Pat's boat years earlier. And it was a match. The lab reported that Damon's ski nautic boat cannot be eliminated as a possible source 
of the red paint smears. It also could not be definitively linked as the source of the smear. It seems that the red paint was an extremely common variety. It was also tested against a red lawnmower, and there was speculation that the red buoy markers to the bay may have also been the source of the smear. Although the evidence is sparse, many point to Damon Crestwood as a key witness, or perhaps even the perpetrator in Pat's case. There could be much more to the story of Damon Crestwood under the surface, or there could be only coincidence and a disturbed man battling his own demons. In addition to predetermined bias held by investigators early on that Pat had not been the victim of a homicide, the re-examination of evidence by Lori Baker also pointed to other failures. Namely, the inventory of items first listed in Pat's boat did not match items later tested for DNA or fingerprints. Two water bottles, one partially full and one empty, were listed as present in the boat, but later, when the items were processed, the second, empty bottle was missing, as was one of the two fuel tanks. Baker found no indication that these items were processed. She found that not all items that could have been tested were, and wrote that, the fact that the boat was stored outside and unsecured speaks volumes about the mindset of the investigative team. Jill Mullen's ceaseless efforts to keep her husband's case in the public consciousness and push for answers has not been in vain. In 2020, the FBI were able to review the case file and reclassify Pat's death as a homicide. In 2022, his case was featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Jill became engaged to be married to a man named Mike. She eventually sold the home where she and Pat had raised their boys, but decided to remain in the area. Her new partner is supportive of her efforts to find out what happened to Pat. They put up signs together seeking any information, and they maintain the Pat Mullins Memorial Fund. Pat death is not solved. Pat's homicide is not solved. And we need that to be done. And that was the strange case of Patrick Mullins. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge. And I'll see you in the next one.